All right, so now we're going to cover how to actually traverse through an array, how to look at all of the elements inside of one. We're going to be covering the last little bit of 8.2 and then all of 8.3 in the uh, textbook. So traversing an array is essentially accessing each element in that, that array one at a time and in order. Uh, so we're pretty much just going to be looping. We'll either do loop or use a for next in order to do that. Um, we actually saw something similar to traversing an array when I was actually creating that Fibonacci array previously, um, where I was actually initializing all of the values in that array to be something. However, in this case, we're more focused on using the values that we are currently looking at as we traverse. So we traverse, we look at every single element and we use that element that we are currently looking at in a calculation. That's what I wanna really think about this uh, for this video. All right, so suppose I have some program where as part of the calculation, the user needs to be able to access a list box full of percentage rates that they get to choose. Um, and then that rate will be applied within their calculation. And the way that I fill out that list box is I'm going to take this array of um, rates that I've chosen right here, and I'm going to one at a time add every element of this array into a uh, list box, into that item collection. So that's an example of traversing this array right here is I'm going through every single one of these values and adding that value into the list box in this particular example. Maybe this is a list of numerical values that I am uh, incorporating in some series of calculations or something like that. But that's what I have going on here with this problem. All right, something I want to note right here is that none of these rates have a coherent pattern. Um, if it was say two, three, four, five, six, I could just use a for loop and set them directly into list rates dot add. I wouldn't need to bother with the array right here, but the array is useful because I'm grouping together all of these values that I can't create using a pattern super easily into one single variable. Imagine if I had to do all of these as separate variables, right? Uh, or separate constants or whatever. Um, that would just be painful. So the array is really helpful because I can group all of them together like this, especially if I had a lot of these that I was working with. I can just group them all like into this one array and then I don't have a whole bunch of unnecessary variables cluttering everything up that I just don't use more than the one time. So, or even just, you know, manually adding everything in over and over and over and over and over again, that would just be a pain. So I can just, store all of them in this array like that. But that's why I chose these particular values because if they had a pattern, I wouldn't have an excuse to really use the array. So I might as well just show off when an array is useful. So I'm going to use this int index variable to hold the current index that I am looking at. So it will start at zero because the first uh, subscript is zero and it will have to be less than the length of this array because this array has five elements in it and the uh, highest valid subscript is four. So it has to be less than the length. As soon as we see that it is equal to the length, as soon as it is equal to five, we know that we are done looking at the array and we can move on with the program. Now I could say do while int index is less than or equal to um, string rates dot get upper bound passing in zero and that would evaluate to four and then essentially run until uh, int index is no longer four. You know, it, it runs when int index is four and then as soon as int index becomes five, then the condition is false and all that kind of stuff, right? But uh, this is just a lot faster to type. So I'm choosing to do this for this example. But that's what we do. So we start out with our index being zero uh, we declare the array, and then while the index is less than five, I essentially add into 
the list boxes item collection, the rate at index, the index number pointed to by int index. So it starts out at zero. So 2% gets added in first. I increase the index by one, go back up to the top, condition is still valid. Then I uh, add in the index at uh, subscript one, which is 5%. That gets added in, index gets increased, and so on and so forth. But I'm visiting index zero first, and then that gets increased, index one, index two, index three, and then index four. That is traversal. And when we're using an array like this, we're going to be traversing it using a loop. Um, especially as our arrays get larger and larger and larger and larger, you wouldn't want to do this manually because that would be a pain. So you want to traverse it using a loop to just avoid all of that extra typing or anything like that. This is a classic example of how loops can save you a lot of time and energy. Here is the same program, but using a for next statement instead of a do loop statement. So int index is just declared in the for statement right here. Uh, I go from zero to string rates dot length minus one. Again, I could do dot get upper bound and pass in zero if I wanted to. I chose not to this time. But everything else is pretty much exactly the same. However, we actually get a new toy to play with, specifically because we're working with arrays. And funny enough, this also works with some of the different collections, like the list box items collection or a string or something like that. But we get a new toy when we're talking about these groups of data, which is the for each next statement, which is very similar to a for next statement, but the syntax is a little bit different. We're saying for each, uh, element variable, we type in a variable name right here as data type in group. A uh, data type would be the type of that element in the group. So for the um, string array that we were talking about, this data type would just be string. Uh, and the group would be a uh, string rate. Uh, and then we have our statement block like we normally do in a for loop. And then you type next and then the element variable. Uh, and to give you an example of how this kind of works, what I want to actually do is compare and contrast the for and the for each statements. So a for loop I could set up as uh, being, you know, for int n as integer equals one, two, five, right? Uh, have some stuff in here and then say next int n. The equivalent for each statement would be if I created int nums to be an array holding the integers one, two, three, four, five. And then I said for each int n as integer in int nums. Uh, and then the statement blocks would be exactly the same. And then I type next int n, exactly the same thing. Now, when I do it like this, right, when I'm using, um, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm typing everything out and using integers with this sort of pattern right here where there's a beginning, there's an end, and there's a particular step, it does look like extra work, which it really kind of is. But what I'm actually trying to show off right here is that these two loops under the hood are actually exactly the same. What happens here, up here, is that Visual Basic kind of creates a collection holding all of the numbers one to five, and then treats both of these cases exactly the same. So there's really not much of a difference between doing one to five like this and actually passing in a array of integers. There is some difference. There's some uh, places where there is a bit of a difference, but fundamentally they're doing the same thing. That's what I want to focus on here. And I think, when I go back to the rates example, you might see uh, how dramatic the difference can actually be when you're typing things out, why the for each statement can make quite a bit of a difference. 
All right, so here's a comparison between the for next statement version of this traversal and the for each next version of this traversal. Uh, the for next version you've already seen, so I won't focus on that so much, but the for each next uh, is the new and fun one, so let's take a look at it. What I'm saying here is uh, for each string curve rate, which will be a string that is contained in string rates, add that string curve rate into my list rates items collection. So this statement here says take every string in string rates one at a time in order. Uh, take the current string that I'm looking at, store that in the variable string curve rate, and then do whatever I want to in within this loop using that name string curve rate. And then string curve rate is the string containing 2% at first. Here it gets added directly into the items collection. So that items collection contains 2%. And then next string curve rate will uh, tell Visual Basic to then put 5%, the string containing 5% into string curve rate and so on and so forth. So that is the big difference right here, but we don't have to index at all like we do with the for next version of this. So there are times where this can make a pretty big difference, uh, especially if you have to do a lot of indexing. So that can be a pretty helpful tool. However, there are also times where you do need to use the index. For example, if you are working with multiple arrays in parallel, and we'll talk about that later in the chapter, but in that case, you can't actually use a for each loop. So it's another tool in your toolbox, sort of like how for, uh, for loops are another tool in, to in your toolbox when working with looping things in general. All right, well, that is array traversal. Um, just a word about how to most effectively go through every element in an array when you're trying to work with the things that you actually have in there. So it's a very helpful technique, but you always want to use loops in order to work with your arrays.